Well, that, that was uh, quite quite a mouthful, and thank you so much. Uh, we yeah. really appreciate it. And, and I don't think we really uh, went beyond that at the time. I think there was an issue of the technical glitch. But be before yeah. I lose my train of thought, right, a couple of things here. Uh, most of the stuff you were talking about is completely new to me. But I just wanted yeah. to highlight to do with, uh, I mean, you, you brought up things that most people attending this meeting will consider trivial, or space, uh, connectivity. I'm, I'm happy to say we have two people that are in attendance. Uh, I think there's a Mr. Christopher Lewis, who happens to be the vice president of uh, ICTAS, right? Um, and I think there's a treasurer as well with uh, Milimo Munyati. And incidentally, both of these people are going to be giving talks in the next coming weeks. Um, it would be nice if maybe we can perhaps uh, carry on this conversation um, and try and identify people we can engage to try and see how we can help. Uh, I know that uh, we have the so-called Zambia National Data Center. I mean, if we have that platform, why do we have to store data on servers in India, right? Um, yeah. I mean, a, a lot of uh, questions, I was writing down things here, but I'll open the floor to whoever has questions and then uh, maybe I'll, I'll speak somewhere towards the end or something. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, if you have questions, just feel free to mute your mic um, and then ask away. Uh, uh, Christopher Mirimo, thank you so much for coming through. Thank you, thank you. If, if people have questions, maybe you can ask away or something. Surely there are questions here, right? I, I saw some people that we worked with in uh, CS, I mean, CS, CS, CSC 5741 from last year. Surely when Enes was talking about AI, maybe you have questions to do with, uh, you know, what sort of uh, so-called uh, supervised learning techniques we can employ to try and help them out. I mean, I'm sure people have questions here. The, the floor is open, please ask. Hello. Uh, yes, uh, 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 Dr. Piri, you had asked a question that I I expected Dr. Zulu to uh, to answer uh, on the uh, storage facility uh, which UTH is struggling with. Why they cannot have uh, a storage facility outside the premises of uh, UTH. We gave an example of, say, India. Uh, uh, possibly you can comment on that. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that question. Yeah. So, um, really, the, the, the answer to, the, to that question is as simple as we do not have. And uh, I, I want to believe that... Uh, um, it's an issue of, uh, um, I don't want to preempt what has been done before, but uh, uh, requests have been made. I mean, people, even before I joined the department, have been struggling to, oh, you know, make, you know, uh, people procure, you know, the necessary storage uh, facilities for these uh, uh, images. And uh, I think I, I must say that the struggle continues. Um, I'm sure one day they, that, 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 that uh, request will be answered. But as it stands now, I, I have no real question to take to, I mean, the real answer to give you that this is the reason why we do not have. This is the reason. The issue of the tele radiology, especially the saver, we're using some, sometimes we use the saver based in um, Zimbabwe. Uh, it came in because locally in Zambia we have very few radiologists. So there was an understanding that was made between the government and uh, um, I think it must be a private entity uh, in Zimbabwe that uh, we could actually send some of the images to them and they generate reports, especially when the cancer diseases hospital came in because there was so much demand for investigations to see how the cancers are spreading. Uh, so we needed a, 
extra eyes to help with the uh, interpretation of studies. And that is how they brought in the issue of teleradiology, especially to partner with the, that entity in Zimbabwe. Uh, but surely there must be a solution to that. I mean, we can't continue like that. Locally in Zambia, we need to have our own um, for obvious reasons that we've already talked about, uh, data security and things like that. Uh, I do not know whether it's cheaper to, to do that kind of arrangement or to have our own. Um, as I said, <laughs> some of these I may not have answered being the end user and I'm not directly involved in, you know, we do have a, a department at the University Hospital called the IT department. And these are people who make recommendations uh, on, on our behalf that uh, we need some of these equipment, we need some of these services. Uh, so, I mean, I find it odd that you, you, you'd subcontract a company in Zimbabwe to, to make sense out of data or to generate reports on your behalf. I'll be, I'll be the first one to say that uh, the people that we train at institutions like the University of Zambia, you know, they have, they have the necessary expertise to do that, even much more actually. If, if you look at the, the content that we cover in most of these uh, postgraduate programs that we offer, it's, it's actually far, far ahead of some of these problems that you're highlighting. Uh, I've always thought, right, from experience, and I've, I haven't really been at UNSA for that long, but I've always thought that the fundamental problem we have is this inability to work together in groups right? Um, you'd be amazed just how many experts we have at places like UNSA, for instance. If you look at ICTAS, for instance, I mean, these are people with various expertise. You talk about data security, I mean, we, we know that we have people that can offer those sort of services to you, local expertise, right? So um, I don't know. I mean, some of it might be political. I mean, we've had stories about how uh, mm -hmm. things do with tenders are sort of like processed. Uh, but fundamentally, I think, I think the one key thing is the inability of people to work together. That's been my experience. I mean, I've seen it in other domains. Uh, I interact yeah, a lot correct. with people in the education sector, for instance. Uh, not too long ago, I was attending a so-called UNESCO partnership forum. I sat there and the problems people were talking about, these are, these are things that people with computing backgrounds will not consider problems, right? So I don't know, I mean, hopefully, uh, so one of the things we're trying to do with these seminars is to, to try and see how best we can work with industry, exactly. work with researchers. Uh, and this is, this is something that has come up over and over again. Uh, in 2018, the, the ICTAS president did highlight the fact that one of the things they were wanting to do is to try and see how they can have industry interact more with uh, academia, you know, researchers. And in fact, the youngsters that are more interested or that are more effective really when it comes to implementation and development of this technology. So, so I don't know, I mean, it's a, I, I, find, I find it odd really that we, we, we are interacting with India or we, we are engaging India and Zimbabwe when we can do those things, right? And some of these things you're talking about, it turns out that the people in the room, I'm always done people, but the people in the room, um, I mm -hmm. know that some of them have mission science background. And so when you are talking about things like, uh, you know, um, electronic records management, for instance, um, archive records. I know that there are people that probably sat there and were thinking, "Oh, wait a minute! I mean, these are things that we can do." You know, so yeah. you know. Uh, but more questions, anyway. That was my rant. <laughs> yes, please. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Yes, Doc, uh, thank you very much for that elaborate presentation. Indeed, uh, it's been uh, enlightening and the, it gives us a lot of uh, questions in where we can pitch in and just offer solutions to your profession and the, the country uh, at large. I've got uh, uh, yes. three questions, if I can say. The first one is I will refer yes. to the challenges that you indicated that uh, you've uh, noticed uh, that is happening right now in terms of the increase in the number of uh, requests for uh, uh, for you people to be able to do these uh, images and so on. You alluded to the fact uh, that uh, physical exam the art of physical examination is, is dying out. Uh, I wanted to just appreciate how you came to that conclusion. And uh, okay. secondly, 
Uh, which particular streams? Uh, I know there could be pediatrics, uh, adult hospital, and so on. Which particular streams uh, do you see this particular problem emanating from? And uh, the third question, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, radiology information system and the packs that you alluded to where your data is being stored in, uh, in Zimbabwe and India, uh, as uh, Dr. Lighton had mentioned, what particular algorithms have you come across or which are being implemented in, in those particular systems? And uh, what, has been the, what has been your experience really in terms of the turnaround and uh, your thoughts on that? Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, so um, uh, to answer your first question, to do with um, the art of, um, you know, clinical examination. Uh, so I've been sitting in the... Um, um, I have been sitting in the Department of Radiology for two years. And, um, you know, when a, a study is requested for, it comes with a request form. And in order for you to attend to that request, it must have um, an indication, what we call indication. That is the reason why we want, you want that study to be done. And um, quite often we've actually seen that um, we receive requests to do certain examinations for which simple uh, clinical examination of the patient could actually exclude what you are suspecting, okay? Um, and sometimes we actually reach a point where we have to seek uh, audience with uh, uh, the requesting doctors to actually come to terms with, so that we can actually discuss and see the way forward because we also need to protect the patients uh, from unnecessary exposure to radiation. Uh, so we actually get this information to answer your question from the request forms that we receive in the department. We actually note that these are some of these, are, you know, indications which necessarily do not really need to have uh, uh, examinations done on the patient. Then you had the question on um, uh, which, which streams, and I think I would say it, it cuts across. I, it, cut acro it cuts across, I mean, almost from every, every department, uh, we, we receive requests which we actually have to put aside first and uh, uh, seek audience with the requesting physicians uh, for, you know, either to change the modality that is supposed to be used and or to call off the examination completely. Okay. And then I think your last question was to do about um, the algorithms that have been used. Uh, do you say algorithms to, uh, for the, please just repeat that question for me, the last one. Yes, please. I was saying uh, what algorithms are being used in the systems, if you, you have been privileged enough to see exactly which particular algorithms are being used. You did mention that the current system that you're using, uh, you are storing data, for example, in Zimbabwe and India. Yeah. And the, what has been ex your experience in using the system, the turnaround time and anything that you'd, you'd like okay. to share? Great, great. Okay. And just um, uh, be, uh, as I answer that question, I just want to clarify that for India, we do not store our uh, images from there, but we discuss uh, with colleagues. We, disc we are able to actually load images. We can send a few images to them, uh, load them and discuss the findings. But for the Zimbabwe one, this is where we actually send our images. They are kept there and worked on. Uh, the issue of the turnaround time, uh, there is an improvement uh, of the turnaround time for those reports uh, because there are slightly more radiologists there. But uh, from what I have seen for this short period of time that I've been in the department, the reduction in the turnaround time is not marked. Yes, it is there. There is a reduction in the turnaround time of the reports but it's not, you know, 100% significant to, for us to really, uh, you know, have to do that. Um, hi. Hi, Doc. Hello. Can, yes. uh, can you hear me? 
I can, please go ahead. Okay, thank you for the presentation. This is Chris. Um, uh, it, it's a good presentation and an eye opener. I had a couple yeah. of questions and uh, also a few remarks that I wanted to sort of like make. Um, yeah. Dr. Lighton had indicated I come from uh, ICTAS, but I also work for APSA. Uh, so yeah. I have uh, a very good in, um, understanding of uh, storage of all these information systems, the data and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things that we, we could do almost immediately, I'm just thinking, is um, mm -hmm. we might need to be probably linked with um, your IT department just so that yes. we can start solutioning for some of these uh, things. I think sitting yes. and um, we can ask all the questions, but I think it's high time we started looking at how do we solve for some of these uh, issues. Um, the issue of Thank the data... I think that's what we need. Yeah. yeah. The issue of the data being stored in uh, Zimbabwe, for example, uh, I think that's a bit embarrassing for us as a profession because I think that's something that can easily be done in country. In fact, uh, when you look at some of the pieces of legislation that have been put across the ECT Act and uh, so on and so forth, they actually do not allow for personal information of individuals to sit outside the country uh, if not approved by the relevant uh, authorities. So. Um, in in uh, setting up the um, the data centers, uh, the ZNDAC, which is now Infratel, the government had that issue in mind. So they've set up a lot of uh, there's a lot of infrastructure that has been deployed in country to be able to store the amount of data that uh, I have seen on the slides. Right now, uh, Infratel are sitting on about uh, five petabytes of uh, space storage that is enough to run a, a cloud uh, for the whole nation here um, and so this some of these things can actually be consumed almost uh, immediately so i think that is mm -hmm. something that we we, we we probably need to be able to link the it department together with smart zambia and infratel because i think something can can be done almost uh, immediately and just to ensure that yeah. all these ECT issues are actually being adhered to. Yes. Yeah. The other bit has so, to do with... Uh, yeah. Sorry, you wanted to respond? Please, just uh, you can finish. I'll hold my thoughts. Okay. So the other bit has to do with um, investments into this uh, sector. Uh, having worked with uh, a lot of these vendors and uh, multinational companies, uh, the IT ones and so on and so forth, um, you tend to see that there's a high affinity towards um, spending agencies and those agencies that actually have the budget to spend. I can almost just imagine um, how the budgeting cycle is done for UTH and some of the gaps. So you'll find, for example, that your investments into uh, IT, which can be measured by your IT budgets and so on and so forth and training, might not be that adequate and they might not be that adequate because probably there's a lot of uh, issues when it comes to this uh, funding bit. There's no one who's going to go into an investment and, um, you know, do it for free or donate and so on and so forth. They want those returns. So there's, there's a part also there that has to sort of like um, uh, be developed. Uh, I know as part of the Smart Zambia objectives, having a smart nation with all these big data issues and information being uh, stored securely. It's one of those top agendas. I think this can easily um, also be looked at because we're talking about patients' data here and one of the critical issues uh, in the nation. There's a lot of storage that is at uh, Infratel right now. There are a lot of things that uh, Smart Zambia are working on with the likes of Zamtel and so on and so forth to even be able to offer incentives or some form of uh, innovation around how they can work around on the government one to make sure that we pull the whole thing of how data is sitting in Zimbabwe and, 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 and so on and so forth. The picture on the backups and um, uh, how we are storing those in, 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 in what is in um, uh, the papers, uh, what do you call them, the x-rays and so on and so forth, the disks. 
I mean, that looking at any of these um, international audit standards, it would fail because uh, just that image doesn't give comfort around, um, you know, there's uh, business continuity planning there or in case fire swept through there, do we have copies being kept elsewhere and how are we able to restore so on and so forth. Uh, and I think these are some of the standards that we can easily uh, then chip in to help our colleagues and, and, and make sure that we, 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 we solve this issue. I just wanted to ask two questions on what uh, you had shared. On the sharing of images, are these being done using um, email or how, how are these being done exactly when you say the images are being shared between um, uh, countries? And then so I wanted to find out on the effects of technology on, on, on the human. I, I, I heard you talk about um, you don't want to expose the human body to radiology and so on and so forth. So when we're dealing with all these machinery that you talked about, and, and you must forgive me, I, I don't know a lot of these technical uh, uh, terms when it comes mm -hmm. to medicine, but putting the human body under all those lights and stuff, what, what are the effects and what are some of the things that then you, you look at uh, in trying to ensure that then it doesn't bring in more harm for, for the human body? And thank, okay. uh, sorry for the long uh, question. I uh, just uh, <laughs> thought I shouldn't bring out those. Okay. Um, thank you so much uh, for, for that. Um, in responding, I would like to first of all try to clarify over uh, the issue of um, images that are being shared. Um, you see, this was done. Um, you know, it's, it's not an arrangement that the Invest Teaching Hospital has made. This uh, was an arrangement that was done by the, the government of the Republic of Zambia. And, uh, you know, I also want to protect myself, not to mean that uh, <laughs> they are, you know, giving away patient's information. All these issues, uh, I must say, of data security have been looked into uh, in that arrangement uh, to say that this is um, where we could actually have people that can actually help us uh, improve on uh, the turnaround time for, for the reports. And so um, we have a, a few images, some images, not everything, but some images that uh, go to Zimbabwe. And, um, you know, we, 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 they, we, we, we report with them. They give their inputs, we give our inputs and reports are generated, sent back here and uh, given to the patients so that the people treating those patients can actually have uh, a direct direction on how to proceed with the management of the patient. So I'm very, very sure that uh, all these issues were looked into at the time these uh, understandings were being put into place. Um, so then your second issue that I want to talk about is um, the question of uh, radiation. Uh, you were asking what effect does uh, radiation have? It's a whole big topic uh, concerning radiation safety um, uh, for everyone, for the public, should I say, patients, uh, visitors and the like. And this is the reason why you will find that when you walk into a radiology department, you will have a, a signage everywhere to tell you where you can pass, where you cannot. Um, radiation in itself um, has actually what we call stochastic and deterministic effects. So, uh, well, not to waste time to try and describe what those are, but there is a certain level to which you can get uh, radiation. Ionizing radiation does damage cells in the body. It does damage cells, but um, the body has its own um, measures to repair the damage. And so what is really harmful is repeated exposure. Repeated exposure to radiation would be harmful um, over a long period of time. And so, um, this is why when we, I talk about protect, protecting the patients against exposure, I need to minimize the number of times that the patient is exposed to radiation. Uh, the effect in most cases uh, of uh, radiation is that patients may actually develop um, a cancer and 
but you know the most vulnerable are the children because they still have a very long life ahead of them such that uh, if that effect has to happen it may actually happen when they are still you know alive but for adults you may find that um, even before time is long enough for them to develop the effects of radiation they would have actually passed on due to other natural causes so really even us who work in the department yes we are at risk but um you know it's about uh, how much exposure you get so this shouldn't be something that should <laughs> make you fear you know about uh, these examinations i mean the the benefits of doing such examinations outweigh the risks most of the times and that's why uh, we are there to scrutinize who ne really needs to have the examination done and who we think may have to wait or we can um, advise other modalities that are uh, more friendly uh, to actually to do that. Okay, no, thanks, thanks, Doc. And uh, maybe just a clarification on the earlier point. Um, yeah, so the, the, don't worry about being protected. I don't think that we, <laughs> we mean it in that way. But I think sure, sure. what what will help is um, just being put in contact with the the head of the exactly. IT department so that we just discuss yeah. and see. I'm I'm more concerned on how we solution for for what we can almost immediately. Uh, what comes into my mind is those backups and stuff like that. Surely, this is something that can yeah. be done. Yeah, and we should get to to do it um, once we get in touch with 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 the person there. Great to be appreciated. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Uh, any any more questions? Um, uh... Yes, Dr. Perry. Yes, please go ahead. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dr. Zulu, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, I wanted just to uh, get more clarity. When you mentioned that um, the, the backups or some images are sent to Zimbabwe, you also mentioned that because in Zimbabwe there are so many, is it radiographers? So I wanted to find out. The geologist, yes. Um, was the, the basis of um, having the storage being done in Zimbabwe, is it because of the radiologists or uh, lack of space that we don't have in here? Because I, I, I noticed that you also emphasize that uh, in Zimbabwe we have so many radiologists that we have in here. Surely. Um, it was all based on um, um, the fact that there was need to improve on the turnaround time for reports and not really for the storage space. Um, surely, if, even when you Google, you can actually be able to find information on how many radiologists we have in Zambia, how many we have in every country of the world, you are able to get that information. In Zimbabwe, they are better than us. Uh, uh, I think I can say that. Uh, we have fewer radiologists, especially those working in the public sector. They are much, much fewer than we have in other parts of the world. And so there was a need to have these reports, you know, uh, come out as quickly as possible because diseases don't wait. You wouldn't want to have a CT scan done today, and then you take so much time to wait for the reports to come out. Meanwhile, the disease is eating up the patient. So there was, in the interim at that time, it was thought that maybe we could collaborate with uh, our colleagues nearby where we can share you know, images and then they help us um, generate reports and so that our doctors locally can have actually a basis on how to approach these patients. So really, it was not based on, um, uh, I want to assume, because I was not there that time, I wasn't in the department, uh, but I want to assume it was purely based on uh, the number of uh, radiologists and uh, the turnaround time for reports. Uh, sorry, Ennis, just to piggyback on, on, on the question mm -hmm. from Robert here. Um, I know you said we can Google this, but do you have a number? How many radiologists do we have? Um, in, the, in the public sector right now, we have uh, about, uh, I think, seven radiologists working in the public sector. Seven, I guess. Yeah, yeah. But we have in the private also, private hospitals do have their own. 
uh, numbers of which I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure about. So you mean seven is like the whole country? <laughs> yes. Oh, that's, that's concerning, huh? Yeah. I mean, so incidentally, I mean, I guess like this is a sh one of those shameless plugs here. So one of the things we do in CSC 5741 is um, some of the things you touched on, things to do with uh, AI yeah. and machine learning. And, and we are hoping, yeah. right? We are hoping that some of these problems that you highlighted can be mm -hmm. carved out into research projects, hopefully next year. That is in fact one of the yeah. reasons why we're having these seminars. And one of the reasons why we're reaching out to industry. And the idea is to try and see how we can help. Uh, it's quite sad, really. I mean, if we have seven, then I'm wondering what what these other remote areas do to cope with this. Um, are there radiologists based in places like uh, Chipata, for instance, or you know, Mongo, the western part of the country? Yeah, so not at all. I mean, uh, the few that we have are mainly, you know, concentrated um, within Lusaka and the Copper Belt, <laughs> just along the line of rail. Elsewhere, really, we do not have. And, uh, you know, just to, 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 to get back to your comment, I think this, I, I really think that uh, you have to, you have to involve me in this uh, because uh, really, I want to believe that maybe these participants, everyone who is listening now can actually maybe correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think that um, there has been much uh, follow up of you as specialists, especially in this health industry, particularly when we talk about medical imaging and uh, radiology, I don't think there has been much. So I felt that this was going to be an opportunity to make people open their eyes that uh, there is actually this other part of uh, computer technology where computer technology is applicable and uh, your services would really, really make a difference where if you were to come in and, uh, and, uh, and uh, help. Yeah, and, and I guess to add on to what uh, Chris raised about, you know, uh, us to try and identify what we can do in the interim. And I guess to add on to that, maybe something else we can do is to try and do what we can do in the, to try and identify what we can do in the long run and how we can partner with the different stakeholders. Um, I'll be the first one to say that my interest in all of this is from um, research point of view, right? So. Most of my contribution is probably going to be based um, in that particular area. And I'm happy to say that I, I work with an army of students, right? So most of these, I was writing down these problems. Do know that eventually I'll probably cover out some of these things into a very simple end of year projects, you know, so these projects that we do at fourth year. And hopefully some of them will result into something more meaningful. Some of them might not, but, yeah. but the idea is to at least do something and not just sit and wait for outsiders to solve some of these problems on our behalf. Um, yeah. I'm curious though, how, how do you, if you share data with Zimbabwe, how, how do you share data with other hospitals? For instance, do you exchange data between, you know, is data exchange between the public sector and the private sector? And I'm asking because at some point you raised um, um, this issue to do with uh, trying to identify, let's say, is it afflictions that mostly affect people, right? You can only do that if you have access to data. You share, you share data with these other health institutions. Um, if you do, how do you do this? How do you, is a, is a doctor in Chipat able to share uh, it scans or whatever from that part of the country to the radiologists that are based in Lusaka, for instance? Are you able to share data from Coptic? Um, or are you able to pull information from Coptic or are, you able, uh, and are they able to access the data that you generate? Unfortunately, not. Even with uh, the Zimbabwe arrangement, really, it's not sharing of data per se, but sharing of images. Uh, suffice to say that the images are in form of data. So we share, the, we send the images, we upload the images onto their cloud. They are able to access the image, the images, uh, interpret the images and uh, generate a report and send it back. Uh, so as of, uh, regards to, you know, how many cases of this condition we have seen over this review period, 
you know, system performances that we are not able to uh, communicate with them. It's only on the basis of interpretation of uh, images. And this is one very big area that we need because even for planning, we need to actually understand how we are working. And this can actually be found in the radiology information systems. These are the areas that we really think are critical. I should say, I think they are, are critical to actually have so that we even planning, future planning, we should be able to do that based on the data that we generate in the radiology information systems. So for Zimbabwe, it's mainly you know, sharing of uh, um, medical images for the purpose of interpretation. Hello, Dr. Zulu. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Uh, okay. I heard you mentioned about AI, artificial intelligence. And yes. uh, I think it was a question which you answered uh, yes and no. I would like yes. to find out from you, uh, how often do you discuss that topic with your colleagues? Uh, thank you very much. Um, you see, as you see me here, I've been in the department for two years now. I have, have never seen, um, uh, you know, an artificial intelligence um, agent parks or reach system. Uh, but uh, we, you know, being a student, I read and um, I know that this is what is obtaining elsewhere in the world that artificial intelligence has been, uh, you know, integrated into radiology and computer aided diagnosis are being made a subject to verification by a, a radiologist. But here where we are, you know, we, well, I, I, to specifically answer your question, I don't even remember that we have discussed such a topic uh, with my colleagues over artificial intelligence. But I have mm -hmm. had interest really in radiology information systems and uh, PACS system and uh, that is what led to me even, you know, ag agreeing when Dr. Piri mentioned about this presentation, I felt it could give me more exposure interacting with you uh, who are really in the realm of this, uh, in this particular uh, topic. Oh, uh, uh, the reason why I, I asked that question uh, mm. is basically because I know that uh, whenever you you, you introduce technology. Obviously, uh, there will be casualties. The numbers of uh, member, uh, members of staff, definitely some people will be laid off because uh, there will be some sort of efficiency that will be introduced and uh, maybe their workforce may not be needed. So that's why I was asking because I've seen it elsewhere where I've worked. Uh, whenever yes. technology was introduced, we had the reduction of manpower. Yeah, otherwise, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I have thank enjoyed you. your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, th sorry, if I can keep in Floyd. Uh, thank you for, for your comment. I thought it was funny. I was laughing all along. And I kept on thinking, he said there are seven radiologists, right? And, and I'm wondering how many jobs are going to be affected <laughs> if you just <laughs> seven, right? Um, no, I was joking. But I thought it was an interesting thing to bring out. And uh, hopefully, any yeah. of an answer to that thing. Of course, yeah, and uh, we, you know, um, we want to believe that uh, the radiologist relevance will not be completely wiped out uh, because we are dealing with machines here. They may be more uh, accurate than the human eye, but uh, remember that uh, the radiologist is an interface or a link between what you are seeing in the images and uh, what the patient is suffering from. Um, and that, that's the reason why radiologists are trained to be doctors first. You have to complete your medical training and then uh, take up uh, you know, the training in radiology. So we have all the basic skills, uh, you know, uh, basic medical skills that every doctor has. And where we find that there is a mismatch between uh, what the images are giving you and the clinical information provided, we are supposed to walk and go and talk to the patient ourselves 
if we have to get the clinical history from the scratch, make our provisional, you know, diagnosis and, the, you know, link that to what we are seeing on the images and advise our colleagues uh, appropriately. And this is a reason why we think that artificial intelligence may not completely take away the job of the radiologist. No. So the, the, if I can chip in again, there was, there was an issue that came up again on, on whether Ines discusses uh, discusses AI with, with colleagues. And it's right here, and I'm thinking, uh, I guess what we can do um, as an institution, at least I know I can offer this service, is to try and see if we can, if we can help introduce people to some of these things. Another shameless mm -hmm. plug, yeah, I happen to sit on a, um, the so-called steering committee for the African Summer School in, um, it's called the African Summer School on Machine Learning for Data Mining and Search. And so one of the things that the ACM is trying to do, this is an ACM pioneered um, initiative. What they're trying to do is they're trying to mainstream AI, rather machine learning in this case, on the African continent, right? So I guess what I'm trying to say is, um, and again, I'll reach out to you, NS, in the sidelines, but if there's anybody else interested in here, please ping me. Very soon, maybe we can arrange some sort of a seminar or workshop where we go to Ridgeway. Um, yeah. We just have maybe a half a day event, and then we, 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 we start out by just introducing people to the very basics and see where we go. Right? It turns out that most of these things you're talking about, uh, uh, if you ask our, our CSC 57 foot one students, they'll tell you that uh, um, these are trivial things. Right, yeah. uh, the stuff that we have is slightly more complex than than what would introduce you guys to. So, again, I'm tying to what Chris raised here. Some of the things that we can do in the interim, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Great. Hello. Yes, please. Uh, Doctor Zulu. Yes, please. Uh, that was a good uh, presentation, though I joined it about halfway. Okay. Yeah. Um, you have answered uh, part of my question, but um, uh, there's a part that I'm still not clear. Yes. So I'm trying to find out if um, what the the guys from Zimbabwe are using to to do the analysis of the images that you are sending them are they are they using AI or they're just using their human eyes to interpret interpret the images and then send you back the reports. And if it's if if that's the case, if they are not using AI, what's why should we have to send them for them to interpret when we have people who can also interpret you, the radiographers? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so they are using purely the same tools that we use to um, interpret the images here. So we have what are called DICOM viewers. Uh, these are applications that uh, we use um, to manipulate the images to get some details from the images. Um, they are all over. I mean, you can get anywhere. You, these are tools that you can actually put on your computer to help you analyze the images. And exactly that's what they do. They don't use artificial intelligence at all. They use the same tools that we use here. And uh, this goes to show that exactly the reason why we are able to do that with these guys in Zimbabwe is just to increase the number, you know, of radiologists looking at the reports and so have the reports quite in a good time as opposed to waiting for a long time for one radiologist, two radiologists to, to look at the images. You see that uh, in um, a CT scan, for example, on average, we 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 examine perhaps 50 patients in a day, okay? 50 patients in a day, that is one CT scanner. So there's a CT scanner here at UTH, there's a CT scanner at CDH, there's a CT scanner in Chipata, there's a CT scanner on the copper belt, in Dollar, Kitwe, you know? So if you were to, we don't have the correct statistics of how many images for CT are done in a day, the whole country, okay? But there are a lot compared to the number of radiologists that we have around. 
But CT scan is not the only one. We have ultrasound, we have MRI, we have fluoroscopy, we have mammography, we have conventional radiography, which is X-ray. All these require that uh, we, we actually write reports for them. So it's purely the number, you know, reports are way, way outnumbering the people to interpret them. That's the, 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 the more reason this arrangement was started. Okay, thank you, Doc. Then uh, quickly, if uh, we are to talk of uh, coming up with an AI system, it means we, we have to have some, some kind of um, a correct analysis of those images that, that are sent. So my question is, how often do you pick out errors in the analysis that come from maybe combined the analysis that you do here in Zambia and the analysis that is done in Zimbabwe? How often do you pick up uh, errors? So I saw a lot of uh, CDs and files containing images. Yeah. Can we safely say yeah. all those images have got correct uh, interpretation and, and report uh, which is showing a correct picture because it's, it's cardinal when you're trying to, to train a system on how to interpret the, the images. So how, how often do you come up with, uh, with errors? Thank you. Um, at, at, the moment, at the moment, we do not have a system where we take, in this, we take a second look at the, um, the reports that come from Zimbabwe. Uh, we rely <laughs> we rely on the fact that we know the credentials of the people who are reporting these cases, that they are fully qualified. Uh, but to check back on their reports, we do not. And uh, even the most experienced radiologists can actually have, make some errors in terms of their reports. So uh, um, unfortunately, this is where you have to weigh. Should I sit and uh, look at the report that has already been generated and look at the images the second time around? Or I should help the next patient that has been pending or waiting for the report, uh, you know, for the past, I don't know how many days. So you obviously want to say, okay, this one, at least they have a report in place. May I go and help the next available patient who is waiting? So. Errors, I'm sure there could be errors, but uh, at the moment we don't, you know, look back on those images that we sent to see whether they have correctly been interpreted or not. Uh, we bank on the fact that we are sending them to people who are trained. Okay, I don't know if I'm, I'm asking a lot. <laughs> Sorry, just, um, <laughs> yeah, because, uh, the accuracy will be key to developing a system that you can trust when it comes to, yes. to AI. So are yeah. you thinking of, okay, what are we going to do about it in order to ensure that we are training the system the correct things? I know we can bank on the fact that uh, people interpreting the images are experienced and the like, but there's also a fact that you said there are there are certain things that a human eye can't see that a machine can can see. So to some extent, we we need some kind of um, some some kind of um, yeah, accuracy, yeah, an assurance to say this interpretation or these interpretations of these images are accurate before we even start training the the, the system. So I don't know if uh, we're going to go into that as well, taking a second look to ensure that um, we increase the, the level of accuracy, I don't know. Sure, uh, you know, I think at the moment, and this is my opinion and not the opinion of the department or the hospital, but my opinion is that I think artificial intelligence is not our immediate problem uh, that we would want to go into as of now. I think we have, uh, um, maybe smaller pro challenges that we can attend to, but that can make a very big different, different, you know, a big difference in our operations. So uh, that yes, we may look at that, but not uh, not in the interim. Uh, I think that can come maybe later. Uh, we would wa want to solve issues of uh, 
storage, you know, issues of connectivity between the hospitals. I would want as a radiologist to be able to receive images that are generated in Chipata. I interpret for them, I give them a report as of using my human eye, at least for now. <laughs> it may not be 100%, but at least for now, that patient in Chipata should have, you know, a report for the doctors to, to be guided on what to do. As, opposed, as regards to accuracy, maybe we also need to uh, bring in our colleagues who are in the pathology department because, um, for example, if we see a tumor in the brain, we may recommend that that tumor be biopsied, meaning they cut a small piece and take to the laboratory to examine exactly what type of a tumor it is. Um, maybe we need to start getting feedback from them and compare with our, our findings in the radiology department to correlate with the findings in the pathology lab. But we do also have patients that actually die before even a biopsy is done, but we looked at their images. And the culture here in Zambia is that uh, almost all the families will not allow doctors to perform a post-mortem for a patient who has died. And so we, those cases go without exactly establishing what problem it was. Yeah. Maybe if you can just a comment on what Nonde raised here about uh, accuracy of the data. So one of the things that, I don't know if Ennis remembers this, but one of the things that uh, I, I had hinted to him was this. We know that uh, currently the, the sort of records that they have that they've analyzed could be classed as being weakly labeled, right? Because only one person has labeled that information. So there's no guarantee that, uh, in fact, the diagnosis, whatever you want to call it, is actually accurate. But we've toyed with the idea of uh, saying, if we had to create a properly labeled data set that could be used as a basis to implement whatever machine learning um, model we might want to implement, what we could do is try and see if we can involve a second pair of eyes, or perhaps two, so that we visit the already existing weekly labeled data. That way we'll be assured that the, the data set that we'd actually have access to was properly labeled. So again, it's just one of the things we can yeah. do, but again, if you look at literature, you realize that uh, expert judgment is actually considered a uh, robust evaluation. Right? So the odds yeah. that uh, if they have uh, a thousand labeled um, records, for instance, the odds that, of course, there are probably some entries that we are incorrectly classified, right? But but it's highly likely that because they were done by an expert, um, then mm. a huge chunk of them actually correctly labeled. So, but, but these are all things that we can, you know, look at as computer scientists. And I know Ennis, by yeah. the way, these people are both you know, t t telling them, say, the things that you're interested in, storage, it doesn't excite yeah. them, I'm telling you. They're more excited. <laughs> in bigger stuff. things. It's not, yeah. it's not a problem with solving it is. Um, unfortunately, Christoph has actually offered that this is something that we can quickly take up and try and see what we can do. Ah, oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, please. Oh, yes. Okay. Hi, Doc Zulu. Yes, please. Yeah, good evening. Good evening, Doc Lighton. How are you? And uh, the rest of the guys. Good. Thanks, John. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Doc, for the presentation. And uh, unfortunately, I found it on slide 26, somewhere there, because of oh. uh, load shedding. <laughs> but anyway, um, from what I've uh, heard you explain, um, I wanted to find out, I think someone asked a question in terms of um, the image processing algorithms, if I told you previously, yeah. yeah. Uh, though I didn't oh. get it clear, uh, I think, uh, I don't know what type of image processing algorithm that have been used in, uh, uh, in the actual classification in Zimbabwe, but from your explanation, it's like it's manual, like from these experienced uh, radiographers, then they send the report afterward. Radiology, sorry, then they send the yeah. report back. I think, I don't know if it's due to manpower or experience in Zimbabwe. I don't know. Then secondly is, um, for how long have we been using, like, have you been depending on Zimbabwe? Like this Zimbabwe dependence syndrome in assisting us to interpret the images. Is it one, of, is it because of one of the challenges that you mentioned, uh, political will? Uh, uh, I don't know. Like for how long have we been depending on Zimbabwe? We can't really 
uh, train our, our own and uh, radiologists and be responsible for this and like sending the data to another country and then let us, uh, we give them to interpret them, get the information back in. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that question. So, so yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Uh, uh, Doc, uh, doctor, uh, thank you very much uh, for your, your presentation. I wanted to find out something uh, uh, concerning the very data that is uh, maybe taken out. Uh, how secure is it for from manipulation um, per se? Because you just told me to say it's just uploaded into the cloud and then they interpret it and then get, generate a report to you. So I was trying to find out how, how secure is it from uh, issues of manipulation? Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you so much. I'll, I'll begin with, uh, is it Christopher's, uh, was it Crispin's uh, question? Yes. Well, yes. John and then... no. <laughs> yeah, who was asking about uh, uh, whether, I mean, this question keeps coming up uh, for the Zimbabwe thing. I mean, uh, it is simply uh, the issue of manpower, really. And I must mention that the data that we actually send, uh, what, that we upload, on, remember I mentioned that we don't have uh, uh, in our system, we don't have the radiology information systems that capture uh, the patients, we call them demographic details, you know. Demographic details include where they stay, where, you know, marital status, how many children they have, and, you know, um, we do not have that uh, radiology information system. So all that information remains confidential on the patient's files. And those are physical, you know, files, which are paper, paper that in the hospital. So what we send is only the name of the patient, the age of the patient, the problem, and uh, the image, which we have generated. So they will look at the image and write a report in the name of that, I mean, for, the, for, for that patient's name that has been provided to them and send back the report, period. That's all what they do. Um, so there isn't sharing of information other than that, apart from the images and uh, the name, because they will need the name to write a report to attach to that. And then um, uh, the, the next person who came in asked about uh, uh, sorry, I'm losing my thought. <laughs> the, the last, the last question, please. Man. Uh, okay, I was trying to find out about uh, security in terms of manipulation of uh, the data that is uh, uploaded. Exactly. So yeah, uh, I'm not so sure if um, uh, w from an end, end, end user point of view, I don't know what sort of manipulation that information will be susceptible to. Uh, uh, you know, like, like I've alluded to, it's just the name of the patient, the age, the clinical, the clinical problem that the, the patient has and the images. Uh, that, those are the only, you know, that's the only data that we send. And I don't know how susceptible that information could be to manipulation. Um, so really, um, maybe you may help me on that one because uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not so much uh, into, uh, you know, like uh, susceptibility of information to corruption, you know, by third parties, but that is the information that is, uh, you know, transmitted between, between the two. And uh, I, I want to say again that uh, they don't use any special tools, uh, you know, they, they just use a ma manual examination of the images like we do. You could have a study which has, say, a study of the brain, it has, say, 1,000 slices, and so there are 1,000 pictures which you have to look at as a radiologist, uh, you know, and uh, you just browse through the images, detect the abnormality, and relate it to the knowledge that you have to say, if it is tuberculosis in the brain, it looks like this. Maybe this is a, a tumor in the brain, it looks like this. And then you write a report based on what you see and you advise the doctors on how they should proceed. 
So really, that is the only information that is shared with those guys. Uh, and uh, they give us feedback, just like we do locally. They will send uh, images to us, we interpret and give them a report. So if I can just chip in uh, another shameless plug here. Uh, it turns mm. out that besides the manipulation that uh, Mwemba is concerned about, one of the key things that people are normally concerned about, um, at least in 2020, is uh, this whole notion of uh, privacy, right? Um, yeah. I, and I thought it was nice that you, you say the demographic information is not shared. But for anyone no. who is currently listening, interested in data privacy in the health sector, we tentatively are expecting somebody from CIDAS. Um, Shash Rumpai happens to be head of informatics there. Um, and mm. I'm pretty certain it's one of the things that he's going to touch on. So if you're interested in that particular topic, yeah. uh, beyond the out, I've, I've kept the emails. I'll be flooding your mailboxes with invitations. So you want to attend that. And then on the Zimbabwe yeah. issue, which seems to be coming up over and over again, I thought, I know Ines, you've told me about this, but maybe for people to appreciate the challenges yeah. associated with analyzing these image scans, medical images, maybe you want to give people a sense of how long it takes for you to analyze these different scans that uh, you generate. I think okay. people appreciate to do that. Yeah. Okay. So let me give you an example of um, a patient who has a cervical cancer, for example. Here is a young woman, say 33 years old, uh, they have done, you know, has presented to the gynecology unit uh, with symptoms suggestive of, uh, um, uh, suggestive of cancer of the cervix. So in that department, in the gynecology unit, they will examine the patient and they will do certain tests to actually uh, um, investigate for cervical cancer. One of the tests they will do probably is a, a, a cone biopsy. They will do a biopsy. They will take to the pathology lab, and it comes out positive, you know, for cervical cancer. The next step is that the patient will be referred to cancer disease hospital so that they can manage that cancer. The requirement at the, um, you know, cancer disease hospital is to know is this disease process still localized to the cervix of the patient or it has started spreading because cancers have that tendency to spread to the rest of the body. Because how they are going to manage that patient depends on whether the cancer is still local or it has spread. So they want to do a CT scan, for example, to check the lungs. We know the areas where cervical cancer likes to go or to spread to. It is the lungs, it is the liver. So you want to investigate using a CT scan to detect has this cancer spread to the lungs, has it spread to the liver in the abdomen, and locally in the pelvis where the cervix is, what is the scenario there? Has it spread to the local areas nearby organs like the bladder and the rectum? So you, you want to do a CT scan of the patient starting from the root of the neck all the way down probably to the hips so that you look at uh, all those areas and detect areas where the cancer could have spread. Now, that's a very big part of the body, you know, and uh, you could do very thin slices for you to see small, you know, areas of metastasis, we call it metastasis of the cancer. Very small areas, you need to slice the body into very thin slices. So the thinner the slices, the more, the images you generate. So you could end up with about 3,700 images of the body that a radiologist needs to look at to look for areas where the cancer has spread. So it is not something that you can say within <laughs> five minutes you would have finished uh, reporting. You have to look at the lungs, you have to look at uh, all the organs in the chest, all the organs in the abdomen, all the organs in the pelvis. Apart from that, a radiologist wants to look for incidental findings. Just because this is a cancer patient, it doesn't mean that they can't have a pneumonia in the lungs. So you also want to exclude other problems, concurrent problems that are taking place in that patient, so that you don't have to re-image the patient um, later on. You want to you know, be thorough. So this is, um, you want to take maybe two hours, you are looking at uh, one case, to be able to, you know, uh, write a report and be able to be, 
you know, clear that you have given a concise report to the people who are managing because it has a bearing on how they're going to manage the patient where they are going. So now you could, you know, you could imagine having so many cases. Others are coming just the chest, just the abdomen, others combined, including the brain. So that's how much time you need to spend on one case. So maybe just another quick question tied to that is, you as an expert, roughly on average, how many scans do you analyze in any given day? You said, I mean, uh, you have very few radiologists. On a good day, how many do you pass through and diagnose or analyze, whatever you want to call it? Okay, so um, different, um, you know, countries have different standards. Um, gen it is generally accepted that for emergencies, uh, emergencies, when we say emergencies, we talk about trauma. For example, road traffic accident and um, issues to do with stroke, you know, those are, are considered as emergencies, um, you know, like blood vessels rupturing, like an aneurysms rupturing, all those emergencies. Um, it, it, it is generally accepted that you need to, if you have to remain sober and be able to, to, to be thorough in what you do, for emergencies, you need to look at um, uh, about 12 cases in a day. 12 cases in a day. Um, but then when you look at emergencies, you don't follow, you know, the, the time that is spent, like you are, you, you are you know, examining a, a cold case like cancer. Because this is an emergency, the, you, you, have, you want to act within the golden hour. The patient has presented and something has to be done urgently to the patient. So you want to be quick, but accurate. Beyond 12 cases, some people have determined that uh, you, your concentration begins to go down and uh, you may not be as accurate <laughs> as required. So it's generally uh, accepted that around 12 cases then um, for emergencies you are supposed to rest. Uh, but for these other, you know, cold cases, tumors and other problems, well, you need to be thorough, so you take more time, and I, I wouldn't want to attach any specific time to it, except to say that it takes it takes quite some time. Yeah, uh, very unfortunate, and I was trying to tie those 12 cases to the seven radiologists. Now I know the seven don't include uh, people such as yourself who are training right now to no. be specialists, but still, you're looking at maybe less than 100 cases in a day, right? Um, yeah. Again, God knows how many cases you have. So um, to the CSC 5741 students, this is potentially an open research area, right? Yeah. What can we do in the way of automation to try and uh, automate that workflow? There's a lot we can do. Uh, these are things we're going to be discussing hopefully very soon. Um, are there any other questions? I see we've uh, struck the, I don't know if it's two hours now, but uh, I, I have time. I don't know about people here, but uh, I wanted to find out if there are any more questions. If not, then maybe we'll cut this short. We can always invite Ernest again. Once for the CSC 57 foot one students, once we cover the more important things um, and you're in a position to better understand exactly how we can provide solutions to some of these problems. Uh, so any more questions? Uh, Dr. Zulu. Yes, sir. Uh, I know you've answered. Maybe I just didn't pick it. I wanted to to get clarity. For how long have you been sending uh, these images to Zimbabwe? Oh, thank you. I think that question came up and I, I don't remember that I answered it. Perhaps it slipped off my mind uh, with the, the subsequent questions. Uh, but I, um, well, I joined the department about two years ago now and I found that arrangement in place. I'm, I'm not in a position to give you the exact date uh, of how long that arrangement has been in place, but I think what the information that I have is that it came about with the coming of uh, the, you know, the cancer disease hospital. 
Yeah, the cancer disease hospital has been running for quite some time now, but when the second phase of the cancer disease hospital came in, where they started now admitting patients to have their own wards, they started having a lot of cases, apparently even from the region around uh, Malawi, Z Zimbabwe, and other countries around, they've actually been sending patients to the cancer disease hospital. So the requirement for CT scans uh, increased, and that is how they entered into that understanding. So roughly, I would put it probably five years or so. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zulu. The other question is, the, uh, in, your, in your view, uh, maybe as a department, uh, what is the department doing about uh, your staffing levels? Are there plans to train uh, youngsters, graduates to become, uh, to join you so that you can listen the, the work that you have? Uh, yes, and in fact, um, this is why I'm here. Um, not to train, of course, but to be trained. <laughs> so you can imagine the university teaching hospital, the whole lot of UTH has always had uh, probably at most uh, only two uh, radiologists, trained radiologists, qualified radiologists. Um, so it was the government's um, initiative, actually, when they looked around, they saw that we are really lagging behind, especially in this area of radiology. Uh, we have quite a number of surgeons, we have physicians, we have pediatricians, obstetricians, good numbers as a country. I think we are not very bad in Africa when it comes to the patient specialist ratio in those fields. But for radiology, for some reason, uh, I don't know, we've lagged behind. And so it was the initiative of the government. Uh, they saw that the population of the country is increasing, and we're also having increased uh, requests for radiological examinations. That is how they actually began this program, which I'm doing now. It must be, I think, the initiative of the minister that is currently serving in the Ministry of Health uh, that we needed to have uh, this program to start so that we could train radiologists. Um, from time in memorial, the University of Zambia has never had this uh, program at postgraduate level for to train radiologists. So even I should want, I, I, sh I should believe, or let me say, or state, uh, you know, categorically that all the radiologists that we have here in Zambia are foreign trained. None has been trained locally here. But their first degrees, they did their first degrees here as a, uh, bachelor of medicine and surgery, but to acquire the uh, radiology specialist degree, they had to train outside. So now it used to be a challenge. Government has been having, you know, challenges to send people abroad to train, and that's why they actually decided to start this program locally within the country so that we can uh, boost the numbers. At the moment, we have 11 of us who are in the department to train. So. Uh, hopefully, in the next few coming years, probably four years from now, we could uh, start changing the numbers altogether for radiologists in the country. Thank you. All right. Uh, I, I see the, the head is, is thinning here. We at some point we had a little over 20 people, but we have 12 now, and I know most of the 12 are the uh, CSC 57 for one students because there's, there's something that we, we are meant to discuss. Uh, I don't know if there are any other questions, maybe we can close. Uh, any last comments, remarks, concerns, or questions? Okay, uh, if, if there are no questions, Enes, listen, thank you so much for finding the time to do this. Uh, I'm sure something positive will come out of this, right? Uh, well, something has already come out of this, right? Uh, our interaction yeah. with uh, our colleague, CSC 5741. Uh, right, so for those of you that uh, are interested in attending subsequent sessions that we have, uh, next week we have somebody working in the telecom sector coming through. So if you're interested, send me mail and then I can add you to our mailing list, and uh, who knows, maybe you'll find out a thing or two about uh, how they analyze uh, data in the telecommunications sector. So I just pasted my email in the chat feature there. 
Um, and so for the senior student, I noticed some, some uh, colleagues that we interacted with last year in the same course. Uh, one of the things I mentioned was that we could potentially start um, exploring ways in which we can share knowledge with uh, our colleagues at UTH, right? Uh, so if you're interested, if you're, if, if you're working in an area, a research project to do with machine learning, and you've been reading up a lot, reach out to me. Uh, maybe we can call you to be part of a group of people that are going to go out there and uh, interact with these people. We are really serious about this. Uh, and uh, finally, thank you so much for finding the time to, to attend this session. Uh, the session is recorded, and you should be able to access it on your calendar. Uh, if you can't access it, or if you are not sent to an invitation, send email to Lighton, and then I'll send you a link. I know John said he joined late, so if you are interested in watching the one hour, 30 minutes that you missed, uh, just send me an email, and then I'll send you a link to the recording. Uh, otherwise, that's it. You are free to leave. Thank you so much, Ennis. I'll call you after this. Uh, but please, okay. for the current 57 foot one student, um, let's just stick around and chat a bit more about uh, about the course. Thank you so much, and uh, take Thank care. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Thanks, so.